First of all, I'd like to thank you, Santel, uh, as well as Dr. Lloyd, for sharing uh, such a deep insight on formulation and chemical interaction of process and analogies. I work for Blendtec Corporation. We are an innovation-based company, and uh, we are around for about a quarter century and a little more. And uh, we provide batches as well as continuous processing solution for uh, raw material handling as well as for finishing the product, making cookers as well. Full automation and integration is one of the things we always aim towards because uh, uh, material handling as well as these kind of uh, solution require a more automated control if you want to keep track of how things are changing. We have got a support staff with uh, food scientists and process engineers on board and over 15 international patients. Anyways, I'll uh, shed some more light on how the process and analog cheese are handled in these machines. Only three things are important, and that's time, shear, and temperature. With regulation of time, shear, and temperature, you can pretty much control and the texture or analytic properties of process and analog cheeses. On your left, you will notice a flow chart which uh, is about the process flow diagram of a typical uh, cheese processing and uh, shows pre mixing operation, cooking operation, holding, vacuum de aeration step that is an optional one, a surge hopper, a cooling sta stage, and forming and packaging. I won't be talking in great details about many of these today, but uh, shedding just some more light on the important aspects. On your right, you will notice uh, protein, fat, carbohydrate, what are they? They're, what we do in uh, equipment design is we zoom out of uh, functional ingredient and come down to more core level of what they are made of. <coughs> and the makeup is protein, which demineralizes, coagulation and aggregates form, fats render off, they also participate in emulsifying, Carbohydrate crystallizes, a lot of reactions occur with the reducing sugar, sugars interacting with amino acids and gel formation. <coughs> Moisture boils away, yield losses may occur, they emulsify and renders off some time. And minerals chelate and crystallize. So this is just a general overview of what changes during cooking or mixing. So we'll start off with mixing, that's a basic unit operation. Sometimes uh, processors would like to pre-mix the product. The advantages are that uh, they can increase their line throughput. It's before the cooking operation to be noted. And uh, it's mandatory for continuous cooking processes because you will have to prepare a pre-mix before you can introduce it into your continuous equipment. Blending during cooking is uh, more of uh, making the chemical interaction between the oil, fat, protein, the surface area increases, so the interaction goes up, and homogenizing is usually not required in general processing. Uh, it's, it's a typical operation which is used for uh, making cheese spreads or very fine emulsions. As shear goes up, the particle size goes down. Effect of shear. As you increase RPM, there are few things which change. Degree of creaming, which affects the firmness of the cheese, and the spreadability or flowability goes down. Similarly, protein hydration, which is uh, going to affect the viscosity or lengthability, goes down. Similarly, the protein strength formation goes up, the protein starch matrix forms, and the degree of fat emulsification goes up. So these are some basic functions of how shear affects. This is taken from a research work. So this is a very typical uh, scenario, and it may change based on your formulation. Unit operations. Cooking is one of the most important unit operation. Batch, continuous, low shear, high shear is also applied during cooking. Typically, in batch operations, the temperatures vary from 70 to 90 degrees Celsius, and time varies from 5 to 10 minutes and there are some outliers for other products which may exist. Low shear 
50 to 150 RPM is a typical uh, RPM range which is found on bench cookers, spin auger design. There are high shear cookers too, and uh, they may go as high as 1500 to 3000 RPM. Continuous cooking, again, continuous cooking is, uh, you will find that the continuous cookers are pretty small for the volume they process or are capable of processing. Continuous cooking may involve temperatures of 90 C to 100 degrees Celsius, and the time is basically pretty short in continuous processing. It depends upon the pump which is used for uh, providing the product into the continuous equipment. Shear is about 500 to 3000 RPM. They are all also high shear, uh, as well as if you have certain kind of agitator design, you can have low shear or something like particle slurries, but not in cheap processing. Direct steam injection is what is typically used in these equipments, and uh, that ranges from 25 to 45 psi steam pressure. The injection valves are of various different designs as available in market. <laughs> many companies use poppet valves, many companies will use orifice kind of steam injectors, so they vary. And uh, they also provide some additional shear on the product. As the steam goes in, implodes, condenses, and you have a little more shear, shearing effect. What are the effect of temperature? On a similar note, like shear, uh, effect of shear, we have, as the temperature increases, the degree of creaming goes up. Based on a research study, up to 95 degrees Celsius, the creaming goes up, and after about 110 degrees Celsius, the, the creaming starts to drop out. As you can also see from the burnless graph on the left, uh, about 95 degrees Celsius, there's a decline on the effect of creaming and firmness. Protein hydration goes up typically up to 80 degrees Celsius and uh, starts going down from about 110. Degree of fat emulsification has no change. Fat globule size has no change with the temperature during processing. Protein strand formation goes up, protein starch matrix will up. These are some key, to, key parameters we aim for in equipment design. Effect of cooking and holding time. It's a similar kind of uh, scenario where you see that as the time changes, up to 15 minutes, you can achieve a really good creaming. But as you keep on doing the holding operation, you will notice that the after 30 minutes it will start to go down. Protein hydration, uh, it has got a similar effect, and uh, you will notice that it will also start to go down just like creaming happens. Degree of fat emulsification. Uh, Scientists have noticed, based on the research work, that uh, fat will emulsify pretty well as you're mixing and you're holding and temperature is maintained. But as you keep on holding it for a longer period, the fat starts to agglomerate and uh, your degree of fat emulsification starts to go down after 60 minutes. These are some general things based on a typical cheese product, so nothing different about it. Protein strand formation goes up. Type of cooking equipment. We've got batch and continuous cookers. Batch cookers are designed, and basically all, all of these cookers are designed to handle product based on these three things, which I just talked about, time, temperature, and agitation. If you can control that, you've got the right cooker for yourself. Scalability is one of the important things. Uh, cookers can range from small 5, 10 pounds lab unit to 5, 500 pounds, 500 kilos or 5,000 kilo machines and multiple machines can be set uh, in a batch continuous operation mode for mass production. Repeatability and consistency is one of the biggest issues which uh, uh, processors, processors face and uh, it's important that those machines can regulate and are automated to handle the product, and that's what accounts for the consistency of the finished product. Cleanability is one of the biggest challenge 
all the processors have. <coughs> and uh, there are several design uh, features which equipment manufacturers incorporate into the machine in order to have them more sanitary and cleanable. This is a typical layout of a continuous process system. You can see this is a continuous system, but it has got a batch continuous premixer operation. What they do is they will load the product using a belt conveyor into either one of the premixers, and it will go into a premixing state where they will form this nice uh, slurry of protein and fat and water, and it will go into a search hopper. From there, it will be continuously supplied into a continuous process equipment, a thermal screw where direct steam injection will take place. It will go into a holding tube afterwards, where it will be held for the desired duration. And further on, it will go into a vacuum flash operation and, or go into a cooling operation. It's applied to a surge hopper. And uh, finally, it will be sent to forming or packaging. The, what are the advantages to these processors? Basically, we've learned about time, temperature, shear, but to control that is really important. And you can see the automation is, is, is what we keep on top of everything. What we do is we uh, in, install PLCs on these machines, and these PLCs can log data, they can store it, as well as we integrate several equipment into one line, so an operator who is standing on the floor uh, working with these equipment can easily control the process, which is really important. There are multiple recipes. Recipes are automatic, so basically equipment can uh, ask operator to load product, they can ask operator to uh, move it into the next stage after the loading is done. It can work for a regulated time period as identified by the product development guy. So those things are really important for us. Sanitary design, as I was talking about earlier. Removable agitators are present on most sides of the machine, and they uh, allow you to clean it in a better way. Sanitary fittings, CIP able machines, daily grade finish, and material of construction. Most people ignore what material of construction is on their machine. The composition of the steel and all those things. And it's really important what you buy from the market. So a good manufacturer of a process equipment will provide you a certificate for the material construction, which is, which is again really important. Improved direct steam injection. Direct steam injection, as most cheese processes are heated up with direct steam, it's important how these injectors are designed. And poppet valves mounted to a common manifold are typically present on these cheese cookers. But what controls them is a modulating steam control with a PID loop. And those things are really important And how you can have a pressure, temperature-based control for your product. And that also helps in reducing the energy usage. Blending designed this poppet valve, which has got a 360-degree steam injection into the product. And what that does is it impinges the way the steam is introduced onto the product as well as it also accelerates the condensation process, which allows you to have uh, reduced energy usage for a given uh, volume of steam introduced into the machine. Improved instrumentation. Instrumentation is what we always rely on. Temperature transducer, pressure transducer, there are new versions. These things, these products get take as they get processed, and self-cleaning temperature probes are present which can wipe themselves out as, and go back into the machine for uh, enhanced temperature measurement. Inline conductivity sensors, F0 uh, value prediction, and dynamic rheology measurement like change in torque, change in amp draw on the motors, all those things. Again, reliable equipment design and product of consistent quality is the target. Thank you, guys.
So scal scalability is a very deep topic of how, how you approach it. You have to scale up the number of pocket valves, injectors, you have to scale up the motor sizes, you have to scale up the RPMs, and, and those things are really important. Uh, what we do is we, we design something like 5 pound, which can be scaled up to 5,000 pounds, which, which is always a big thing. And it's, uh, it's always important to understand how the product, product rheology is, how the product behaves into the machine when it's added uh, or at different stages. And those things are important. So those are the factors we uh, consider when we scale. In your opinion, what would be the uh, best uh, criteria for this kind of process? Again, time, temperature, and shear. If you keep note of that, you will know how to scale it up. So you need just one, one thing to compare with the energy compatibility. Right, right. Scale or right. Uh, based on lab operation, looking at the instrumentation, recording data, you come up with a conclusion that th these are the common parameters, these are the heat transfer coefficient which can be calculated. And after th that work is done, what we do is go ahead and uh, just multiply it with a factor and come up with a scale uh, or, or a different size of machine. This, this method, I believe it's, it's quite sensitive for the shear and right. Right. So if you scale up and you increase the speed, increase the shear rate, and you get the result in different in both cases, so you are dealing with the material which is uh, generating different characteristics and the group process. So how you manage the clean functionality Right. So effect of shear is important. The amount of torque. Now, you can put a bigger motor for scaling up. That's true. But uh, what you notice is at the torque and draw of the motor, which allows you to understand what will be the torque and amp draw for the similar product on a bigger scale. So that, that's how they do it. I have one, one more question. What is the shear rate you can expect from the smaller version? So you right, right. As the bed size goes up, the amount of torque required goes up. The shear rate. The shear rate doesn't change. Shear rate has to be the same. It's the it's the bed size that the amount of torque will go up. So if you're pushing a certain amount of product on on a big volume, then you will have to push it more. Any any value for hundred fifty RPM shear rate? What shear rate you can expect? That that is. Again, that, that, that topic has to be studied. It, uh, you have to go through trials. You have to understand the effect of time, temperature, and shear on a smaller scale. That way you can scale it. So it's, it's, it's important that you do some kind of trials. And that's why we, everyone sells lab machines, small scale machines. We, we have been using Blente actually. And then we even um, when we look at the top it was a little bit more like this for the action of the Exactly, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and when uh, agitation happens in these machines, solid flight agitators, one agitator moves in one direction, the other one moves in another direction. And as you uh, have the creaming effect, the amp draw goes up, the torque requirement goes up, and what you will notice is that, uh, and I, uh, we, we can actually talk one-on-one -on, -one on this because there's a lot of things we can discuss. Thanks. Thank you.